Okay, um, good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to all of you who've joined us and I'm, I think one or two others may be joining shortly for this round table today. Um, I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to Her Excellency Sarah Al-Amiri, who is an old friend of UCL. She is the United Arab Emirates Minister of State for Advanced Technology, and she's also the chairperson of the UAE Space Agency. Minister, we're delighted to welcome you back to UCL. Thank you for making the time today. It's a pleasure being here with you. Thank you for the introduction, Neil. For those of you who don't know Her Excellency, she, she has the experience and expertise which fits beautifully for both the two faculties that are represented here today. Uh, um, she's a graduate in computer engineering, both at bachelor's and master's level from the American University of Sharjah. And she joined UAE space program in 2009, initially as a software engineer in the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. The fact that she's now the head of the space agency might indicate she knew what she was doing and has done for the last nine years. Um, in her current role as chairperson of the agency, she acts as a regulator for the sector and determines funding for programs, including the Emirates Mission to Mars, Project Hope, which we in STEEP have been working with closely since about 2019. As Minister of State, her responsibilities include defining the industrial and economic opportunities based on the development of advanced technologies in the Emirates and building the country's technology and innovation systems. This afternoon, she'll talk in both those capacities as she looks beyond just Project Hope or Hope orbiting Mars and starting to provide data, but looks to the future as well. Um, during that presentation, all your mics will be muted, but you are very much encouraged to keep your videos on or put your videos on um, while the minister is talking. After that, um, we should have plenty of time for a round table. The minister has to leave at 14.20, but I think that should give us plenty of time. Um, both her opening remarks and the discussion are on the record, and we are recording it uh, in order that those who weren't able to join this afternoon are able to, to watch and, and, and learn later. So a bit of technology and um, housekeeping on the, the Q&A. Could I ask you to use the raised hand function um, or type your question into the chat? If you're, if you're typing your question into the chat, please also indicate whether you're happy to ask it or you'd like me to. Um, but you're, you're, you'll be unmuted for, 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 the, for your question, but I could, if I could ask you to keep your microphone muted otherwise. When we get into discussion, and this is a bit of trial and error in the sense, this is we're trying to do this as a round table rather than just a webinar Q&A. Um, if while we're having a discussion, you as any of you have a supplementary question or you'd like to make a contribution to the discussion, can you again use the, the raised hand function, but a quick one liner in the chat indicating that your, your point is related to discussion should help me try and bring you in at, at the appropriate moment. Um, and one final thing, hopefully the broadband will stand up, um, particularly for me in the country, but if, it, if I drop out, Siobhan will, will take over uh, as chair in the event until I can rejoin. So thank you again for everybody joining and without further ado, your Excellency, we look forward to hearing your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil, and thank you everyone for joining us and good afternoon. It's a pleasure being with you at CL, albeit uh, um, virtually. Hopefully we go back to a form of normalcy, seeing each other face to face in a room. Um, I'll give a brief introduction about the Emirates Mars mission, where it sits today, but more importantly, what is the impact that we've seen over the course of the last six weeks that this mission has been in orbit? The, the, the Emirates Mars mission started as an endeavor to accelerate the capabilities and capacity within the Emirates on both science and technology. The primary focus of us working within the program, the program that Neil spoke about, which had a series of satellites called the Dubai Sat series of satellites, um, started in 2006. I joined the program in 2009. And when this mission concept came to us at, at the center in late 2013 as an idea of getting to Mars to expedite the capabilities, um, the, the general progression of our capabilities were heading towards Earth observation satellites, so smaller satellites, 250 kilograms and lower, um, less complex, so launching a satellite to Earth orbit 
95% success, launching a spacecraft to Mars, 50% success. So you can take the magnitude sort of, of, of complexity that goes between the two uh, technical designs that go into this. So this was meant as a leap in terms of the capabilities of the team that's working on it. So you've got a more complex system to design and develop. So you expedite the development of the engineers. You've got a short amount of time to make that happen. So you, you intrinsically need to innovate in design and development. And at the same time, you need to design and develop a new method or a new model of exploring another planet during the time that we had. Um, and at the same time, we never looked at, at having um, scientists within the center. So having um, space uh, planetary scientists or scientists of any field um, that utilize data from either planets or telescopes or space bound objects um, and utilize that and infuse it into, um, into the research process. Um, so the second purpose of this was to, to develop capabilities in space science and more importantly to create new opportunities for those studying the natural sciences. And the amalgamation of the two programs started a program uh, kicked, uh, kicked off in mid-2014 officially. Uh, the time allotted for development to launch was six years. We launched successfully in July of last year. Uh, we arrived again successfully into orbit um, on the 9th of February of this year. This was a highly skeptical project across the board. Um, from a country doing this for the very first time to the method by which we approached. We worked with knowledge partners, so universities out of the United States. We partnered up primarily with the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado Boulder. We created a new, with all the organizations working on it, we created a team that sort of did not sit in any one organization that worked on this project across the board. And that sort of made a lot of people across institutions uncomfortable because it was very unconventional but at the same time allowed us to form the right methodology through trial and error in some instances and through utilization from past experience on how to build a correct know-how transfer program while designing and developing a new, pro a, a new concept for exploring another planet. And underneath that, we didn't have any scientists uh, who were looking at Mars at the time. So we had to develop uh, capabilities across the board throughout the design and development of the mission to where we are today, where we're starting to calibrate the instruments uh, from this mission. The impact that we've seen throughout the years, and more importantly, I'll just speak because it hit, I think everyone, at least in society, and it in, became reality when we arrived in, in February. It's changed the perception of what the opportunities are and where students and children can set their dreams and aspirations at. So to compare the Emirates that I grew up in, where if I had said that I wanted to become a planetary scientist or I wanted to become a software engineer designing the onboard computer for a spacecraft that was going to Mars, that was something that I personally never even thought that I can think is possible. To today where the Emirates where my children are growing up in, it's normal for them to speak about space and speak about what their aspirations are. It's just broadened the, the, the space by which they are able to cause impact in. The other aspect is, and this is what we worked with Steep in two years ago, to better on implications and impact on how you develop a new sector within the country and how you get the necessary experience when the sector didn't exist so that you're able to um, further develop and enhance your capabilities and start transitioning a lot of that know-how into either diversifying the economy, which is very important for us, or even increasing our own research base and our own capabilities base and our own capacity base. And through this mission, we've seen a model by which we're able to do that. And, and today, across a lot of the programs that we're working on, and we've just launched an industrial strategy that focuses on diversifying our economy and utilizing technology in portions of diversifying those economy by increasing efficiency, efficiencies and also increasing productivity across some of the sectors. It's allowed us to take a model by which we were able to develop a group of people and capabilities through a program and today, even within the context of the space agency, because the space sector is one of the industries that we want to form within the country, how do you now take those capabilities that are developed in engineering, in design and development, and transform those into companies that are working in areas in space that are profitable uh, and complementary to the role of government when it comes either to space exploration, to Earth observation, to providing the necessary data sets and data solutions 
um, th that are that are infused into the system. So today we sit at a point where it's okay for us to rethink uh, what the space agency is meant to be doing within the context of the UAE's industry, within the context of the U of UAE's ac academia, and how do you go about transforming the role into a capacity developer, a supporter of the development of the infrastructure and creating business and demand for space products and services within the country and also amplifying that to the, to, to the region. It has also allowed us to look into a mechanism by which we can develop new sectors. So biotechnology, for example, a sector that, had the, that the UAE is looking at investing in. This provides us a mechanism by which we can um, develop and enhance experience and expertise there and create a form of a safe zone uh, by which you're able to experiment. And that's what talent requires to further enhance and develop and, and, and impact. Um, the, the impact is far above and beyond what we've ever um, truly thought was possible um, as a country from this mission. So our, our target was develop capabilities of a group of people working on this program develop scientists that are then able to um, take on this mission and other missions across uh, to, uh, uh, and other missions for space exploration widen the science space. And what we have seen in terms of the shifts within societies, the shifts within an understanding of what is possible, the expansion of opportunities um, and the removal of of maybe imposed um, beliefs has been something that has resonated um, and will continue to resonate in the long run and has allowed us to um, rethink the programs by which we deploy with regards and and even be able to, to capture on, and that's one of the things that I was interested in seeing in the report that UCL did, which is our risk appetite has widened and it's, been, it's, it's becoming even more and more okay to take on larger calculated risks, to manage them appropriately, because the impact and outcome and output is quite impactful. Um, that's the overarching um, status of the, uh, of the mission, of the why we went towards the Emirates Mars mission, what the outcome has been. A bit of an update on the mission. The mission is operating very well. Um, it's operating as expected, which is something we, you always aim for. Although we always design for the worst case scenario, the as expected scenario is what we want for. Transition has commenced to get into our science orbit. Um, it will take us a few weeks to check our science instruments and make sure that they're observing. Um, in, and we first see that the science data will be open to the public um, as, as early as first week of October. Uh, we'll try to push that either end um, once we verify and validate the data sets. And scientists on our team are really looking forward to it. They're really happy with, with the data that's been captured, albeit that the instruments are still not calibrated, but they still look good. Um, and we're really looking forward to the science, but I'm even looking more forward to how we create an impactful industry based on this learning that we went through over the course of the last seven years now. Thank you very much for the, those opening remarks and, the, and that scene setter. Um, one or two people have joined since we started, so I could just repeat, if you have a question, please use the hand function on, on a question that's in, in play at the time. Please also add a short note in the, in the chat to, to, um, to indicate that. While I, we're waiting for the questions, I wonder if, if I could just pick up on one of the points you made um, Minister, you talked about risk appetite, and I know from the discussion we've had in the past, when the plan was announced that the Emirates are sending a mission to Mars, there was a lot of raised eyebrows, there was a lot of people saying, how are you going to do it? You're going to do it that way? You must be joking, that's incredibly risky, um, but you've been successful. And there is a, perhaps a temptation when you've been successful to say, right, phew, got away, that worked, that's fine. I just wondered if any thoughts been given already to the lessons you've learned from the last seven years and how you, uh, whether it be in technology, whether it be in, in management or, or skill sets and what you need to bring in partnerships, et cetera, that you will now feed into the space program as it develops? So the first is from a technical perspective and from a program management perspective. Um, we learned from 
everyone that has developed a space mission to go to another planet in terms of procedures, in terms of processes, in terms of design approaches, um, in terms of technical build of the spacecraft um, and discarded some of them because they became irrelevant with the maturity of technology, utilized some of them and added some new aspects. And that within the space sector, at least during the first three to four years, and we used to get a lot of peers to our design process and a lot of them, it sounds good. It might sound better than we think. You can go ahead a few steps and skepticism, like you said, uh, even within the experts that, that reviewed um, the program, especially during the first when you don't really see any hardware um, right in front of you. Uh, but today, just that one methodology has allowed us to get a lower cost spacecraft with fewer instruments understood, but with impactful sciences, science coming out of it. Um, so it's, a, it's added a new category and allows a new way of thinking of planetary exploration. So the, the mark of $200 million for that spacecraft versus 400, 600, sometimes up to a billion dollars uh, for other spacecrafts. Uh, gives you sometimes sort of a, a, um, a balance of creating a new category of space exploration and a new approach to space exploration. It comes even into the way of how we selected the design development approach. So we re-looked at all the concepts of redundancy on the system itself and reliability and measured it against, so if you add double redundancy, remove and you do selective redundancy, how much more, how much more fault tolerance do you actually get into the spacecraft, built into the spacecraft. So we utilize a lot of sort of methods and models to be able to come to the final um, design um, with a minimal cost, with being able to test it as much as possible and with being able to get uh, to the launch pad within the time that is allotted and within the budget that's allotted for. So that's from a technical perspective. Another lessons learned, so there was things that we did well, there was things that, that, that were learning opportunities for us and that was on how do you transfer know-how and how do you build a, a mesh of a team of people that, that I've had from our side, um, 10 years of experience in, 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 in space versus people who have had 30 years of experience in a particular subsystem on planetary exploration missions that have touched, that have gone to so many different planets in the solar system. Um, and then you've got the con continents divide. So you've got a lot of time zones in between that. Uh, we also had an influx of new engineers coming into our team because there are particular subsystems that are particular to planetary exploration missions that we didn't need before and therefore needed to do, develop new capabilities across that. We had a lot of lessons learned when it came to how do you do go about that. So we now know who is ideal. So at what stage of development is it good to be embedded within a team of experts and at which stage you're able to work remotely? Um, and, and be able to carry work forward and gain the experience to work, uh, to, to work remotely across different teams. So um, same thing with the project management approach with our risk mitigation uh, mechanism that was built into this, into this uh, um, mission and the way the team functioned. So we had a very open team um, who were able to raise risks, concerns, say let's stop and think about this again we have a concern and worry so this openness within the team um sometimes is not factored in any design document but for for us going through this learning process the success of this mission banked a lot on the success of the team and and on how the team meshed together very well and that was something that we never heard before that the success of a very difficult mission is a human factor and a large human factor is how people work well together, how open the culture is within, within the team, how expressive it is, how okay it is and how tolerant we are of failures happening and, and the failure recovery process. So these are things that maybe we haven't realized through our other programs on how important and vital they are. And today acts as a cornerstone of team selection that, that, that is vital to the success of the mission. Thank you. Uh, that, that, that's, that's fascinating. Arthur, uh, Arthur Peterson, have you, is, is this a question related to the discussion or a new one? Irrespective, please go ahead. It's a new question. I don't know if somebody else wants to follow up. 
I don't think there are any follow-ups. No. Okay, can I go ahead? Awesome. So, uh, Your Excellency, uh, good to see you again. And it's, it's, I have so many questions. And one of them is actually um, about your thinking ahead for the space agency uh, and the kind of forming of new teams and what will be your new mission? Uh, will it again be, uh, let's say, a planetary uh, space exploration like Venus or some, some other planets? I'm just curious to see in terms of its, uh, of course you want to build it into a spin-off for an industrial strategy, but that will ne not necessarily be, let's say, deep space exploration. So I would like to hear a little bit about the, the broad portfolio there uh, and, and then different kind of uh, activities that the space agency will be, uh, will be involved with. But I guess another kind of iconic mission should be already in your mind and you don't have to reveal if it's, uh, if it's, if it's really not solid yet, but it's, I'm just curious about that because I think that's what you may want to do is, is, is have another kind of, uh, let's say, focusing uh, project uh, for the agency as a whole. So the way that we've selected such mission, the Emirates Mars mission itself and the HOPE uh, mission was to accelerate development in particular um, expertise and capabilities. That model has worked um, for us and it will be, whatever mission comes next will be built on developing heritage um, for a private sector that could be spun out into that, that then builds demand for their, for their products and services. Um, and that's the approach that we're taking right now. Is there a fully defined program and project today? Uh, no. Uh, are we relooking at the technology areas that could have a viable um, set of contributions towards the economy and those companies could be standalone? And we know that we have expertise today in, in place. Yes, that's being looked at. The programs and projects, be it a sort of large project or daring project such as the Emirates Mars mission, or be it smaller programs will be towards developing that those capabilities and that capacity and more importantly towards finding the right clients you need to build demand for space products and services before you spin out any company so that you ensure their survivability and the existence of both the customer and the buyer um, and with a reduced amount in terms of customers not because it's not an area that is of interest but more of they haven't seen the benefit of what, what could be gotten out of the space sector. So um, I didn't answer your question directly. I, I, I hope to answer it to, to um, announce a program um, soon, but it will stem from where are we going? And that's, what, that's the question that we're asking right now. It's always been purpose-driven, any program that we've invested in. And right now it's redefining what the purpose is on the back of the success of this mission. And it's been a momentary pause for us at the space agency to look at all these different factors so that we create the right model for the space agency over the course of the next three to four years for it to support the space sector. And I completely agree with you. It's not an entirely industrial drive. You can never have one prong of the, of the overarching ecosystem supported and not supported across the board. It's about how much support you put where and putting together a space agency that is able to identify where the support needs to go at times. So it's that agility that's also being built into the way that we're thinking, the way the team is thinking, the way the team is approaching things that needs that needs to be ingrained into the way that we do we work um, and allows us to further enhance how the programs are selected down the line. Ina, good afternoon. Um, and welcome. Would you, are you following on from Arthur or is it a new question? Uh, it's following on and Your Excellency, it's so nice to see you again and meet you again and to see the amazing achievements of the last few months. Congratulations to you and the rest of the team, of course. So um, I'm so struck by your observation on the clarity of purpose in the, the mission that's gone to Mars and now how that will be continued because in, in meeting some of your colleagues and everyone who contributed to the mission, it was so striking that the purpose went beyond space, that this was a space mission for societal transformation. And so uh, I have multiple questions, but now my, now my question is, uh, in your current role now and your multiple roles, does that, how do you balance that in terms of 
keeping a space mission as a space mission and possible future missions to be about uh, enabling a space economy growth, but also retaining that connection to societal transformation. That sounds very challenging and, and any reflections in terms of how you, uh, where you draw the line would be fascinating. Thank you, Ian. It's great seeing you again. Um, I don't have the right answer because these are questions that we're asking ourselves today. How do you ensure that you're supporting technology development where it's necessary, supporting scientific exploration where it's necessary, and then using um, sort of the aspirational aspect that I was talking to one of my colleagues yesterday saying that space where wherever you are always brings the inner child out in every single person that, I, that I've spoken to and, and, and met. So when do you use it as a lever that brings out the inner children in children and in society as a whole? Because you, it's, space has always been used as a transformational societal tool. And what we're working on today is, is first identifying what are the technology areas that are required. Two, we've already identified what area within the economy that, is, that, 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 that we can fit into, that there is a market to fit into, and that's smaller Earth observation satellites that provides multiple data sets from environmental use to urban planning and so on. Um, and then adding on the layer of where do you need to put challenge in to be able to accelerate growth. And things like the Emirates Mars mission, what it does is because it's challenging in nature, it creates both the societal drive that you're looking for and that you need, because that, that fuels your long-term science interest within society. That, that sparks in somebody that you don't even know today that, oh, I want to become a scientist or I want to become the next engineer that designs and develops a part of a spacecraft. And it's those people that are required in any knowledge-based economy to further fuel organic development. Um, so you use an exploration mission where you want to expedite um, a technology from, from being developed or when you see an area as being stagnant. So a, 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 um, or comfortable and you need to stimulate growth in it. And in the backbone of that, that's where you have uh, the, the background of building the societal passion. Another is, is having the right mix of um, risk to guaranteed delivery versus not so guaranteed delivery um, in the portfolio of programs and projects that are being supported. Um, and one thing I think that is least good, at least I'm seeing it at, at its current state, is that our space agency is not meant to develop any, any systems by itself. It's meant to stimulate the overarching ecosystem to develop their systems, uh, to develop systems and capabilities and capacity and infrastructure and the right governance framework and the right um, laws and regulations that support uh, the overarching sector. Um, so these are questions that we're continuously asking ourselves today as we go into a second strategy cycle for the space sector. Um, and it's these three prongs that I think, which is proper portfolio management and identifying where our risk profile is, understanding what technologies we require and at what state of development they're at, and um, then being able to select and sort of fitting in what sort of programs go into there, um, addressing the two aspects. Thank you. Um, Kartik, you've indicated in the um, in the chat that you've got a question for, for the minister. Would you like to put the camera on and um, and I'm, I'm muting off of those and then we'll come to Catherine and Oliver after that, if it's okay. Uh, thank you. I, I'm very about switching my camera on because my connection is very, it's very unsteady. So is it okay if I keep it off? Yeah, no, no, entirely understood. Um, first of all, yeah, Your Excellency, it's a pleasure to meet you. I was born and brought up in Dubai, so I'm extremely proud of this venture. And I've essentially got two questions. I was looking at the mission timeline. Six years is a relatively short while from concept to development. I was wondering if the timeline was intentionally constrained, and if so, what were some of the challenges? So we've learned from other programs that, that one of the mechanisms by which you expedite one innovation and to expedite know-how transfer is through having a time-bound uh, mission. There is one underlying objective that we had within this mission is and it was not to procure the system. So to have a newly designed system, even if we work with partners on it. The six year 
sort of cap allowed for that because other missions um, would take generally more time um, for that. So it was completely intentional to have that six years time bound on our end, non-negotiable uh, timeline. Uh, we were we were given very strict instructions, myself and the program manager, um, Omron, that this is the timeline that you're getting and this is the budget you're getting, no negotiation, don't come back. Deliver a mission based on the requirements. Uh, and that allowed us to innovate in so many different ways to be able to get to the point that we're at. And we're really grateful um, from just the learning experience that has happened throughout this mission, just due to the fact that the timeline was six years only. Okay, thank you. Oh, I had another question, if you, if you don't mind. Oh, you made an excellent point about uh, diversifying UAE's economy. And this endeavor obviously is a very good example. I was wondering if maybe in the future, these opportunities would be open to expatriates. Yes. Um, everything that we're working on, um, especially in, on every single facet, and, if, and you can see it in a lot of the laws and regulations where it comes to residency. Residency has been open, especially to talent, those that are in the STEM fields, those that are in arts, um, investors for upwards for 10 years now. And I think for the first time, even in the region, there, there is a program for nationalization uh, that is underlying that. And it's focused at talent development and diversification. And a lot of our programs, like I said, nothing will be developed with the space agencies. So a lot of our programs, especially those that are focused on industry, is focused on everyone that is in the Emirates and everyone who would like to come. So it's enabling a holistic ecosystem within the country, regardless of who's working on those programs. Um, more than anything, I appreciate, even through this mission, the importance of diversity across the board. Um, I worked on the Emirates Mars mission with people from so many different backgrounds. And not only on a personal note, the differences sort of amplified who we are as individuals, but on a technical engineering note, the, although we all had a form of the same education, just working in so many different societies, um, brings different nuances to approach to engineering and approach to design thinking. Um, and that's something that I've witnessed firsthand is actually being very constructive to where we got to over the course of the six years of this mission. Um, and that sort of highlighted the importance of diversity across the board uh, to make the necessary impact and output and, and to embrace the differences that bring about um, quite impactful outcomes at the end. Okay, I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Catherine, so I think you were next. Please. Your Excellency, it's lovely to meet you. I've really enjoyed listening to you speak. It's really inspiring. Um, so I'm an early career Mars researcher, so I was following following all up in the launch um, and the arrival really closely. And I included um, the live stream and everything in a lot of outreach work I've done. And um, a lot of the kids I've been speaking to have found it completely inspiring and has made them realize that these are the careers that they want to go into. And I was just wondering when you were planning it, because the outreach and the, and the publicity that you've kind of generated has been outstanding. I've been really impressed by it. Was that something that you kind of planned quite thoroughly or? Um, was it just kind of like kind of by fluke that it was such it was so popular because I mean I it was everywhere I looked like every every news channel all of my social media was just covering the mission and I was wondering um is that kind of continue when you could, with like with data release and things like that is that something that a lot of work is going to be focusing on so outreach was actually built into the 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 team structure within the mission. So we actually had public outreach, but more is more important educational aspect across the board. And all of us as individuals that were working within this program had to participate in science outreach um, and had to give that I'm talking about that since 2014. We had to give workshops for students across the board, be it at universities or uh, within schools. This year, I think a lot of it has reached globally just just because everything is online and, and we benefited from doing that. But everything that you've seen, we've been doing back home over the course of the last six years. Um, programs have been developed by our team members. They've come in contact with people and that what that has brought for us from the mission, um, because societal impact was actually one of the objectives uh, within this mission. But what that has brought to us throughout the development of the mission, especially for children, 
uh, is that it's humanized people working in the space sector. Um, and it's, it's shown something that in our heads we see as unattainable, um, as something that, that is attainable to them because they see the engineer that's working there. They have a dialogue with them and they speak about what they're working on. Um, even our colleagues from, from the US participated in a lot of these outreach activities and has provided sort of a broad spectrum within the UAE on what we can work on. And with the advent of women, webinars, we were able to further expand that. So yes, this will continue. Our science team continues to have efforts uh, with regards to the mission. One of our requirements is not only to ensure that we use this, this science data from this mission and, and get the necessary output, but this mission needs to be scientifically usable to scientists around the world. And therefore there needs to be a lot of outreach that goes into this. So it was, um, it was planned. Um, the pandemic did help in, in, in reaching more people around the world. Um, and we hope to continue during using this mode together with face-to-face -face mode to be able to further sort of um, have that societal impact, but increase this interest in science uh, across the board, even if it's um, just science understanding and just fascination. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next. Catherine, thank you. Oliver, um, you want to follow on? Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, yeah, thank you, Your Excellency. I've really enjoyed the, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about this. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a doctoral candidate, candidate at Steep. I also work for the UK government in technology innovation policies. So I've been really interested to, to hear about your work in this area. My question is uh, more related to the kind of industrial strategy that you mentioned. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on I think that the role of space as and the, the spillovers it generates and almost how you see the role of the space program within the kind of wider industrial strategy in terms of the kind of impact they can have in kind of other sectors and other other sort of technology areas. Okay, thank you for the question, Oliver. Um, the way we looked at the space, so let, let me talk about the approach of designing our industrial strategy that's linked together with technology um, was how do you enhance the so two questions that we asked? How do you enhance your current sectors within the economy by increasing its efficiency and output and competitiveness, either globally or regionally, depending on where they are? Um, and that's how you increase their market size and ensure that performance is also high. And we've used technology adoption across the board there. Um, the other aspect or the other question we asked is what are new industrial sectors that don't exist today, but we have a form of capability, capacity, or interest? Um, that goes into play there. And, and that's where space, the space sector itself emerged. Now to be able, and I'll go back to my previous point, to be able to have a space sector that, that produces for the economy. So one that you have private, private companies that are set up uh, that are designing, developing spacecrafts or have uh, products and services coming from space, you need to ensure your, your demand base sits across the other industries. So the way that we're doing that spillover effect not from technological perspective first, but first from the demand perspective, is creating the products and services that they can utilize in their, in their design and development methodologies or their production processes and so on. And that's the first sort of programs that we're working on today. And those are the easiest to do. It's taking Earth observation sat uh, satellite data or multiple forms of, of data sets and producing the right products and services for the customers. And therefore, you're, you're linking them to things that they did not know that they need through utilization of space products. Then comes the question of how do I use the capabilities that we've developed, albeit for a short amount of time. Um, and that's something that's completely understood. But how do I develop the technical knowledge? So you, what you've designed is an autonomous system. Um, that's what the Hope Mars mission is. That's what our, our other spacecraft is. There are parts of this that could be used in the industrial process. It's a better understanding uh, of how do you take um, knowledge and experience in design and development of one sector and putting that across another sector. So through partnerships that we're currently forming with the Ministry of Industry and Vast Technology that, that supports the, the industrial strategy, Together with some of the research centers that have been established within the country, be it on autonomous systems or others, uh, we look forward to trying to find the right sort of mix by which you're able to translate experience across uh, different fields. So just to summarize, 
uh, one way of doing it is, is developing, uh, gaining demand for products and services out of the space sector. And therefore that's how you, you develop the space sector. The second is by um, seeing how you can transfer experience and expertise across sector that are, that are, and you're removing sort of the domain implications into that. That's great. I think that's really clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ina, have you got a follow up? You're mute. I just to be clear to anyone listening, please do not um, have have me continue too much. Sarah, just to, now to follow up on that. Uh, like our context is that often when when we talk about a national attention grabbing space activity. And then we ask the question of like, what's the value? And we make connections to things like the industrial strategy. It's the idea of spillover. And we see clear spillover connections in terms of technology, slightly less tangible, the know-how. And you already, in many of your other answers and observations have brought in some other things. But that thing that you said earlier about bringing out the inner child of society, I, I, it does feel that the UAE has made so visible of that as like an actual spillover effect beyond space and for this um, scaling out and up of the space economy in the UAE and the region but also the industrial strategy the nebulous question is like well how do you spill over this mindset now of being thinking about the possible not the plausible and like proactive and being leaders in a particular way and the question is quite a selfish one, maybe for UCL and those on the call here, like, so how do, in your observations of that spilling over of that mindset, how is it sustained? And what is the role of universities there? Um, have you seen anything that university partners have done in terms of uh, um, nurturing that kind of mindset? So the, this, the good thing about the spillover is it comes with a form of a hype that you don't need to maintain, at least in the short run, but need to maintain in the long run. So it gives us a bit of a breathing space. I've been in so many meetings, be it, be it they know me that I'm there or not, where bars have been raised and objectives have been raised due to the fact of we've arrived to Mars. Is this all we can do? Can, can, we, can we get further? So that mindset has been infused across the board and you hear that statement more often uh, than, than, uh, than I thought would ever be the case. And it's being used as sort of, we've been able to hit such a large target that a lot of people think thought was not possible and was really difficult to get there. But because we took the chance and because the decision was taken um, to go there and knowing what the risks are, I think some people have sort of breathed a form of a sigh of relief saying that, Okay, it's okay to take on large risks and and um, failure could be some form of an option um, if we know how to recover from it and how to push forward from it. Uh, and that has been something that we've seen across the board um, since launch, but amplified since February. Um, and um, just speaking towards our current industry and advanced technology um, strategy that is dubbed Operation 300 Billion. That's the reason for that is increasing our contribution of industry on into GDP from 133 billion dirhams to 300 billion dirhams in the course of the next 10 years. That in itself is aspirational. And that, that aspirational drive has been infused across so many of our programs today and allowed us to have uh, conversations which weren't possible to have before because of the success on the back of the success of this mission. Now, how do you sustain it is to, to know when um, that sort of ebbs and you ensure that such sort of large pro programs and projects are in the works across different fields. And that's usually the role of government funded programs. And it's being more evident for us in government and in cabinet of using this tool, not only for the space sector, but for so many other space sectors that you need to accelerate development in. Um, and for me, this is a major lesson learned on how do you create a, um, a, a national program 
that stimulates development and creates societal change. And how do you now replicate it is actually a conversation that's happening within our cabinet and within so many different stakeholders within the country on how do we raise the bar even further um, and, and what programs to select to continue raising the bar further so that we can we continue going on this cycle of, of uh, development uh, and leaping forward uh, as a country. Thank you. Um, Ina, do you want to come back on that or? No, thank you so much. That's so much food for thought. Thank you. Yeah. JC. Yes, uh, thank you, Neil. Um, your, your Excellency, Excellency, thank you. It's, thank you for your, um, uh, your presence today and, and, and the open discussion that we're having. It's good to see you again. Uh, and, and many congratulations on the Mars insertion. Uh, that was fantastic to see. Um, so first, I just wanted to come back to you know the aspirational aspect of astronomy and space sciences. I mean, I, as an astronomer myself, I'm absolutely convinced of that, and I've seen it. Uh, very much so, um, as you said, in children, but also in the youth and how it generates passion, not only about space, but also funnels people towards careers in the broader SDI um, ecosystem, um, wh whatever they, they end up doing. This, this is a worthy endeavor that, that space and astronomy can, can drive uh, them to. Um, I, I have seen this uh, firsthand when I worked um, in South Africa on, with, with the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, they did a lot of work on that, and I saw also the transformation of the, um, uh, you know, of the science in the country thanks to the, the SKA, uh, not only the STI pipeline, but also the infrastructure that, that was on, in place. But one thing beyond this that was noted, especially by the, the, um, the government and the, and the ministries of international relations and cooperation in the country, was the change in perspective from other countries uh, with South Africa leading these, these uh, international efforts and these big mission. Uh, and especially that, that, you know, how this may have repercussions on the continent and internationally. And I was just wondering if, you know, you've seen EMM in your efforts um, change the regional and international perspective onto uh, the UAE and, um, and where it stands so far. So I'll, I'll speak of anecdotal sort of I don't have concrete evidence, but anecdotal evidence on meetings that I've been part of um, internationally uh, after the arrival of the Emirates Mars mission. So they're on completely different topics, but it's something that any party that we speak to brings up either to understand why we took this direction and what it has infused if it was a separate, another government entity in another country. And it just a fascination on why the UAE took such a step uh, forward. This wasn't something that we planned into it uh, in terms of perspective, because like I said, it was capability, capacity development, changing society. And the only aspect that we wanted to create a model for was for the youth of the region. Because when we started, when the thinking of this mission started in 2013, the mission, the, the entire region was coming on, on the back of turmoil and failed states happening across the board which was not okay for us because youth makes up, makes up a large portion of this region. And, it, and just by the fact of having youth running such a program that is, that, that is technically difficult and it's odd for a country as young as the UAE to take on, um, it, was, it sparked a lot of interest from the youth in the region. And, and for us, just for them to ask the question of, okay, where else could I put my efforts and how could I contribute in different ways in society and creates the proper positive impact and increases the realm of possibilities for them, for, for people across the board, just in terms of thinking. Uh, but in terms of perception of UAE, I think it's been interesting for, for, um, for people just to see what the approach is that we took, why we took it, how does it fit in, um, and a general interest um, on, we've always been speaking about the diversification of our economy and the importance of science and technology. Um, and hence why this program even existed. But just by the fact that you deliver on a program, it shows how serious we are in terms of talking about diversifying our economy, ensuring that it's agile enough, ensuring that it's continuously evolves um, every decade, because that's what we need to build into any economy and that's resiliency. And it's the same thing with academia um, and, and taking sort of that partnership interest, which was really hard to build at the beginning of this mission, where now it's becoming more 
easier to build and being easier to build not only on the back of on this mission itself, but across the board on so many different um, areas and just speaks of another sort of level of I, I can't put I can't put it into I can't explain this in, in, in words, <laughs> um, but it's it's just been an interesting journey on the doors that this has opened to all of us. And it's not about doors being closed before, but it's more of uh, the the um, abilities that have been open on what we would like to work on, what we would like to expand on that has enabled those doors to form. Thank you. Sorry, it's my turn to be muted now. Um, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Um, there's none in the chat. I don't know, Arthur, have you have, did you say you have multiple questions? Please, please feel free. We, we have a bit longer. Um, I've got one yeah. more that can come at the end. Let me, uh, let me ask another question then, um, which is on the uh, kind of regional, um, regional impact um, and, and that's both in terms of uh, let's say uh, the engineering base uh, the education part as well as, as business development if you go into this mode of uh, earth observation probably as a as a major stream of revenue for your space program and and, and using your your skills uh, capacities developed to to build new collaborations um, What's the regional picture here? I'm just really interested to learn about. Okay, what 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 are what are questions uh, that regional partners uh, are asking? Uh, what kind of services are you are you already exploring in terms of offering through um, through the space program? Just to get a get a larger gl glimpse into. Okay, this is going to be something that has a diplomatic component, right? And that that that, that brings countries together. It would be really nice to see some some examples of that if you really are willing to share some of that I, I can see lots of opportunities but uh, yeah yeah Please, uh... so the first one is how did we build experience in our space program in the number of years that we've done this so 2006 to 2021 uh from going from a small um, earth observation satellite with one camera to image earth at a resolution of five meters i think uh, or 2.5 meters, I can't remember, <laughs> uh, to a space trap that today is orbiting Mars. Um, that has been the primary question that we've been getting from the region. We've worked with uh, Bahrain through the support of the space agency together with Khalifa University out of Abu Dhabi to build experience and capabilities with uh, students and some people, some engineers that have that are, that are working on designing and developing a small satellite um, and building capabilities there. Uh, and there have been other countries who have approached us to look at how to develop capabilities. Uh, we are also building partnerships in terms of value chains with different countries. We've started uh, talking to Israel with the opening up of relationships uh, last year uh, with uh, Israel as a state. And we're now expanding how to be complementary in terms of space industries within the overall region and how to build on each other's overarching value chain. And that's one of the aspects by which you're able to not only build domestic demand, but also build regional demand for the space sector and for space products and services. Um, so these, has been, these have been and continues to be the areas of exploration within the region itself but also internationally and also, sorry, within the region, we're looking at how to further contribute on space exploration without the needs of having multi-billion dollar funded exploration programs. Uh, and that's a question that we've asked, how do we continue, especially with smaller countries, right? Your science base isn't so large. So you have, you're talking about 10, 15 people that are interested in Mars, five people that are interested in stellar science. You're not talking about a large base that, that, that Create, that get value out of these uh, uh, missions. And so one of the questions that I've been addressing to a few of our partners is, how do we go about ensuring that our scientists have access to designing and develop instrumentation and planetary exploration, but without having the massive budgets that larger nations, be it the EU or the United States that have such a large uh, science base are able to, uh, to produce? Um, and it, it's been interesting to see the responses and, and, and the areas of collaboration that come up.
Thank you. Oliver, I think, is that, yeah, is that a fresh hand? It is a fresh hand, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so we, we've talked, we, you've talked a bit about the the kind of, I guess, the kind of role of space, this space program in supporting kind of business and 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 I guess kind of impact is having on innovation. I'd, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on the, I guess, kind of space tech sector and the kind of, I guess, kind of and growing smaller businesses in this area. Well, clearly, it's quite challenging. From, from a venture capital point of view, it's quite different to kind of traditional software companies. So just be interested to hear your thoughts on how you've gone about kind of supporting newer companies in the space or in, you know, things like the funding environment, for example, in terms of sort of private sector investment. So over the course of the last two years where a program has been set up within the space agency, it's been support on a case by case basis rather than an overarching program where, where programs are supported in terms of technical expertise as needed dependent on where they fall under. Um, that is great when you have the target of developing a small number of organically developed um, space companies. But in new sectors, when in the absence of an ecosystem, there's not a lot of organic growth. And if there is organic growth, a lot of them start in the ideas phase, but with lack of expertise to, to bear those into fruition and translate them into actual products and services that are competitive globally, you do require a lot of experience um, and expertise and, 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 and uh, funding and alleviating a lot of the risks that falls into the uh, development process more in, it's existent in technology, but more in space. So the question for us was, how do I build this ecosystem? That then uh, you, can, you can expect organically grown companies or ideas to come into and people to move around. And it's through the identification of which technology areas you can fit into. So there are areas in technology that you are able to, able to design and develop, but the market is saturated or the value chains have been in place and ingrained for the last 10, 15 years. People are not going to change their demand stream or change the companies that they procure from, especially if you're talking about subsystems. So the approach that we're taking is focusing first on a full on system design with a few areas that are modifiable in particular to smaller satellites and keeping smaller small satellites small and focusing on the instruments that go into it. So those that enable you to have different uh, forms of data sets, be it from infrared to visible to ultraviolet, dependent on what your application is. And that way you can play around with your spacecraft design as much as, as you want, dependent on what the mission is. And that's that starts with identifying one, which type of spacecraft category, and that's what we've done, and through market studies on what, what could exist within the market and what could become feasible from a technical perspective, because you need to think of that. If you're talking about investors coming into the play, they need to understand which market player you're in and then looking at which subsystems to develop um, as subsidiary, not subsidiary, sorry, as parts of the ecosystem as clusters around these larger companies uh, and push the development forward. Now, again, like I said, design and development process and procedures in a new company, you need to validate it. You always need to go back to translation and applied research before you commercialize anything, especially when it's new to the overarching sector. So how do you go about doing that? It's through, for us, it's through a, a government supported program project where you're procuring a system that has a set of requirements by which the company is able to design and develop to and prove that it's able to design and develop to over the course of either the funding that's given to them on, on procuring the system or the timeline and so on. Um, and most of it will be based on local demand because you need to initially sort of trigger the development through that, that mechanism. That's the mechanism that today is being put into place in our space policy, in our regulatory framework, and the mechanism by which we go about um, funding programs and projects uh, in place within the sector. That's great, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions um, for Her Excellency? Oh, we, uh, Ina, yeah, you're back. <laughs> Sorry. If, if that's okay. I have two questions and, and perhaps Sarah, Minister, if I, I'll, I'll give you the choice of both. But because one is um, from a UK government point of view in terms of being able to, how can the UK learn from the UAE experience? And here uh, in the UK, we have our own historical experiences with an industrial strategy 
that had a particular role for the idea of missions as galvanizing and mobilizing and creating a space. On the ground though, uh, a little bit behind the scenes, for individual engineers, scientists, policy analysts, it was sometimes difficult to translate a large mission into something tangible that the individual could interpret and respond to. And so one question was about um, if you have seen anything in terms of what people on the team did of like, how do you as an individual do that process of interpretation or what, what can be provided to support that? And if I just then may, my second question would have been about the students here on, who are on the call. I think that it's different now that the insertion has happened. The bar has been raised, you said. And so I think it was so critical in hearing you uh, articulate that being tolerant of failure was such a critical component of making it possible. But now I can imagine that as researchers, students, we listen to you and we think, well, Tolerance of failure was when the bar was here, but now when the bar is here, what does it mean to be tolerant of failure? What does that look like? And how have you or others supported that? Like, how can we be tolerant of failure too? So two, two questions like that. So um, mission-based, um, and we've had this discussion, even Aina, on how to approach um, an overarching science and technology strategy or industrial strategy for any country and use that. Um, the way that we're approaching it is the following. One, you need to have directionality. So the Emirates Mars mission for us was a very clear direction. Get to Mars by 2021, have a scientific mission, very clear. The objective, the outcome, the output was very clear. Um, the how doesn't need to be defined. And like you said, that provides engineers with the direction of what they're designing to. Uh, the other mechanism of doing it and what we've put into our advanced technology agenda within um, our industry and advanced uh, technology strategy is to select which technology areas would enable which, which sectors based on the requirements of those sectors and the challenges that the sectors are facing today. And that's the mechanism by which we can direct industry-driven applied research to deployment and adoption of technology. So that's the second mechanism that has been put into place of doing this. The third one, and perhaps a lesson learned from the mission-oriented UK model for industries, we're putting into, we haven't put into place yet, but we're putting that as one of the mechanisms by which we're able to broaden the areas of fundamental research so that it's not directed and prescriptive. And that's what you need in fundamental research, to not be very directed and prescriptive, but to feed into an area of, of science. So for example, longevity of life. That has so many different research areas across the board, but that's the only way that that through this critical sort of iterative process, and we've been having these discussions for the last three years now on which programs would go where and how to deploy policies. And even if we deploy policies and when we deploy policies, we still revisit them every 12 to 18 months. And that's built into the way that the ministry works and functions. And so that the overarching mi mission oriented the broad aspects for me stimulates interdisciplinary research, provides, I know we're handling a portfolio of science advanced technology, but you can't deliver on science advanced technology without the advent of humanities and social sciences. So it allows you to have this overarching large mission uh, that even social sciences, humanities, arts, anyone can contribute to and peg it to. The art then becomes on how much you support which area based on your overarching national objectives and where you put the emphasis. And that goes to how you streamline funds. So we've sort of divided the three layer, the, the overall ecosystem into three layers, the direction setting layer. And that's where sort of what funding goes where, the funding layer that has also the measurements and the output and the impact and that allows you to continuously reassess uh, the overarching process. And then the implementation, which is across the board in the entire ecosystem, uh, while understanding that you're specific enough in areas that you need to be specific, broad in areas that you want knowledge to be generated in. And then you start balancing the lever based on where you want to go. And I hope that answered your question, you know. Yeah. And then for the second question of tolerance of failure, I'd actually switch it. Before the tolerance of failure was lower. Now the tolerance of failure is higher now that we've succeeded. Um, and the reason for that is 
what this mission has done has proved a mechanism by which we were able to intrinsically handle failure. So it's not failure of the overall mission. Mission was clear. Mission was a success in terms of arrival to Mars. We still have a science mission to go and, and, and I truly hope that that uh, uh, will also be as successful as, as where we've reached to so far. But within it, we did have points of heart stopping um, reactions of things breaking and things breaking several times throughout the testing process. And it's, there is a certain trust that has been, that, that, has, that today the team has, that they've built the right, uh, the, the right mechanism into this project to stand up from a failure to learn for it and to move forward towards the common goal and the, and, and the target. And it comes from the following. Your overall mission doesn't change unless your overarching decision-making process changed or there's a major sort of outside implication that has changed and requires an reevaluation of the overarching objective or program or what you want to deliver upon, especially students. If there's some major um, issue with uh, whatever program that you're developing towards, which doesn't happen unless um, there is a ma major intervention externally, but the common goal is known, the path can always change. And that's what tolerance for failure means. It's going down a path. If it doesn't work, trying to pave another path and, and, and continuing on until you reach your overarching objective. So I would say it's become, for us at least, for the team members, it's become easier uh, the, for the fault tolerance, um, at least externally. Uh, but it's given us a better understanding on how to um, live with it and how to learn from it and how to push forward with it. Thank you for those answers. I think, you know, you better take them down to Bayes, which is our business, business energy innovation science department, because I think they might need them. Um, that's really helpful. Um, this has been a really good session, Minister. Thank you. Um, You've ranged widely, both in your opening remarks and in answering a multitude of questions. Um, and it, it's quite clear that the pace of learning and understanding is going like that um, in the Emirates from this programme and what it's contributing towards the next 50 years of, of society. Um, I think you might have detected there's a lot of interest and, and enthusiasm, enthusiasm amongst those at UCL in, in seeing this work. And we, we hope we can, in some form or fashion, participate in some more of it in the future. Um, and talking of the future, I think it, I can think of at least one person who's glad that there are going to be some future missions, um, and that's the project manager of the EMM. Um, and it is, but uh, where he wants to take you next, I don't know, but it'd be a long way, I suspect. But nevertheless, thank you so much for your time today. It's really appreciated. Um, and um, we wish you the best of luck in the future with the development of all the aspects. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for listening to uh to us today and thank you for the invitation to be part of this good and i hope so you're seeing the virtual hands clapping as well uh, by way of saying thank you very much please pass on our regards to everybody will do thank you great seeing everyone again bye-bye bye thank you bye